What is up, punks? So this is Shinobi, and I am bringing you a special edition of Block Digest with uh, Mr. Frank Braun, where we are going to apply an unusual degree of skepticism towards Bitcoin's future success. So what's going on today, Frank? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm a little bit tired, but uh, it's, it's the winter time, I guess. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I have a line of water bottles in front of me that I'm probably going to drink very quickly. <laughs> That's good. But yeah, you know, I've really wanted to have you on the the show since uh the the guest spot for the um the uh oh my brain. The uh hackers congress this year uh you came on the the tv for my time slot yeah that and was fun it's it's really though like i i really appreciate about your presence in this space <clears throat> that you actually do apply an adult level of skepticism to things and you don't just blindly jump on the meme trains and start going our guaranteed success is here yeah okay it, it to me it sometimes seems i'm just triggering people with that but um i try to be uh reasonable in my analysis yeah i i really respect you for that so i guess um you know let's just kind of dive in i think an easy way to do this would be <clears throat> what are what are some of the the things that people are very confident about with Bitcoin that you have some degree of, of skepticism about? I, I I know there's at least uh, one very recent example from yesterday we can get into. Well, I mean maybe maybe start a bit meta. Um, I'm I'm generally skeptical of this this fanboyism of. Bitcoin fixes this and it's it's automatically going to solve all the problems and um, the enemy is static. We, we, ju we don't have to do anything. Um, it's just going to solve everything. So that for me um, is, is a, the biggest general problem. Um, I think that's very dangerous because people who don't like Bitcoin, let's say um, dates, they are not static. They, they do react and we can see that with um, what are recent examples? Um, this uh, Silk Road money that got confiscated is probably the reason was that uh, the um, transaction was traced by uh, chain analysis software. So that so that is a big big problem is this whole um, um, fungibility issue, which comes yeah due to the lack of privacy in, in Bitcoin. Then you have the whole um, which is applied due to with regulation to exchanges. Then you have the whole um, issue. I think you were getting at that today. Uh, there was this um, news about um, technology to censor um, messages, which is uh, no, sorry transactions, which is easier uh, than it used to be because you have the uh, mining pool centralization, and when you can force the mining pool operators to to apply that, then you can. Uh, at least for these mining pools, filter message transactions. And um, yeah, then there are the whole issues you raised with um, how could you actually uh, find and put pressure on miners? And then there's the whole exchange regulation. So there's, there's a lot of things, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, re really, I think that the core uh, of why so many people are just overconfident with with how our success is guaranteed in, in terms of Bitcoin is that everybody just has this notion that states are stupid, that states don't pay attention to things mm -hmm. because they they fixate on the the clowns and the politicians and they ignore <clears throat> the bureaucracies. They ignore the people specifically in government who are there to pay attention to this mm -hmm. one thing, to not be stupid about this one thing. And 
you know, th those aspects of governments, they are paying attention to this space and they're not stupid. They, they understand how all of this works. And to kind of connect to the this mining pool that wants to specifically filter transactions to um, comply with OFAC sanction lists, even though that is nothing that has been explicitly like requested by the government. Mm -hmm. um, there is this paper in 2016 that came out of the MIT, um, you know, DCI group that funds a few Bitcoin developers called Chain Anchor. And the entire proposal was essentially to create this second layer for Bitcoin that would associate KYC metadata with actual on-chain transactions. And the whole plan was effectively to start bribing or subsidizing miners out of band of the, the block reward to preferentially confirm any transaction that complies with this KYC protocol. And the, the idea is that you just subsidize preferential confirmation until you have a large percentage of the miners doing this. And then once you have a critical mass of compliant miners, <clears throat> you can use that subsidy to outright start orphaning blocks that mine any non-KYC transactions. And so it's actually this really deep understanding of the mining incentives here um, mm. in terms of if, if you tell me not to mine this, but they want to pay me a lot of money, maybe I'll do it anyway. And it, accounting for that and trying to play those incentives against themselves. And th this is four years ago that this proposal um, was put out there. So like for four years, some group, you know, funded um, by the government trying to make things compliant in this space, um, this, this proposal with a very deep understanding of how this actually works has existed. Well, yeah, I think that that connects to what you said about the uh, the government not being stupid. I think what people often forget as well is that um, that the government might be inefficient in what it does itself, but it has a lot of purchasing power and it can use that purchasing power to um, buy um, solutions on the free market. So that's what you usually have. I mean, that's what all the um, private mili military contractors are about and it's also can, what you can see with um, chain, chain analysis software is that the government can outsource these things to more efficient private enterprises who are willingly providing the, these solutions and like you said they often even come up with them and then try to sell them to the government mm -hmm. so it's like this this aspect of you know really what what is bitcoin going to do in the world i don't think any of us know it's just a thing that's here right now um and whether that effect is going to be positive or negative or beneficial to governments or detrimental to governments like none of us really know i agree yeah it's it's hard to tell I think it's an it's an ongoing fight in a way. It's it's uh, everything is is changing all the time, and um, it's totally unclear if it will be net beneficial or not. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I I kind of want to get into um for a little bit here uh, a a project of yours actually um in terms of concrete ways to actually deal with this. Um, you know, you you bring up chain analysis uh, a few times here and mm -hmm. that is such a core problem here is is this the the privacy and everything being out in the open with all the discernible connections there to interpret on chain mm -hmm. so like we actually have to proactively do things here to alter users behavior to give them options to account for that or that's just going to be the default state of things and um 
you know, your, your project, uh, script cash is actually one of the most comprehensive, um, attempts I've seen in terms of specking out a Xiaomi and eCash system. And despite being custodial in a way, like you actually put a lot of thought into federating that, um, and creating a comprehensive model to have, you know, one of the best in terms of, uh, privacy, um, you know, tools or anonymity sets, like to put that out there, mm -hmm. like w what's your experience in terms of like interest and engagement with that? Because, you know, from, from where I'm sitting, um, I never really see any engagement or, or use or interest in those types of things. Um, yeah, first of all, let me say that, um, what you said about I see being the, the core issue. I, I totally agree with that. I think when you when you can have privacy and, and transactions, a lot of the problems we just talked about, they just simply go away. You know, you don't you if you have, you know, private transactions, you don't really have a fungibility problem because, you know, all coins are the same, all UTXOs are the same. You cannot really censor anything um, because you miners cannot distinguish things easily. Um, so in a way that's that's super critical and that's also where we actually moved away from with with blockchain technology we moved away from the features we have with um with just plain old fiat cash fiat cash still has this property of you know being more or less anonymous i mean you have still have the serial numbers but um in practice that it's not that important um but uh, with with how Bitcoin started, we, we kind of get used to this this thing that um, we can trace everything. And with with um, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, it's even worse when they are account based. You know, you you can just take these uh, explorers and type in some somebody's account number, and you get their entire portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. So. For me, that is, is super crucial to solve the issue. And uh, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that and, and thinking about um, the trade off there. I think with, with Smuggler, we, we probably spend, I don't know, two years, three years or so just thinking about how we, we can find a way to build something like um, blinding into a blockchain. But we, we couldn't, we couldn't. Uh, figure it out. I, I think it's probably not possible to, um, to have a fully, you know, um, trustless system is blinding, but you, you can combine them, um, in a way that gives you a lot of, uh, with being at least federated. I think that's where, where the, the trade off lies, you know, that you can have, you know, fast, cheap and anonymous transactions, which are federated. So something like a multi-sig basically um in in terms of interest i mean when we first released the uh the white paper i think that was about a year ago we, we got quite a bit of interest people are talking about it and got some questions what was well received in a way um but then it pretty much yeah fizzled out um my analysis was okay nobody really is interested in white papers um it's you got to show them the code or um that's it's just not that interesting because there's so many white papers um and then we basically now have a running version of the code which we haven't published yet there are also some changes that have to be made to the white paper so it's it's basically public right now so it's a bit outdated um so we yeah we have that running code um which gives you this federated uh show me an eCash system but what's missing right now is uh what i think would be really the the killer there is the actual bitcoin and other cryptocurrency integration where you would basically do pack ins into multi six and then you have these you know uh dbc's over those and then you could do pack outs and was already in the system is the uh, capability to do swaps. So if you would have um, uh, the same 
I mean, once you have this peg in, peg out thing for Bitcoin, you could easily transfer it to uh, compatible cryptocurrencies like uh, whatever Litecoin, Decred. Not sh not so sure about Monero. Should probably be possible as well. Um, not sure actually, about that. I actually think there was just a um, atomic swap protocol um, published between <clears throat> that that would work between like a Bitcoin based system and Monero uh, a little bit ago. I think uh, Janine actually covered it on one of our normal um, shows. Yeah, they're, work they're, they're working on the uh, implementation of atomic swaps, um, but we would need something like a multi sig um, and probably a way to see to audit the amount of money in there, which, which might be possible with the reading keys. Ha, that that is an interesting aspect of that I had not thought about. Because you know, when you back it, you need this, uh, the auditability. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, without going in there, that would mean when you when you have the pack in pack out and with the swap capability, you would have also have a great way to uh, switch money between chains. And um, so the, the biggest the biggest thing holding us back right now is that we are, need some funding to finish development. And um, and although I think it is is a great um, it's a great technology, I'm not sure how to how to deploy it um, without going to prison, basically. Well, I mean that's. <laughs> generally what all of these these schemes come down to and it's it's really the double-edged sword of these types of systems because it, it really is like you can federate the trust model you know like you guys have done um so there's no single point of failure um that's as flexible as multi-sig on bitcoin um can be but ultimately somebody still has to run the centralized server and it's you know what i mean it's it's this it's this ironic catch-22 of here is an amazing solution to really provide privacy on an individual transactional level um but it requires people to kind of um nut up or shut up like instead of just memeing about how all of these things are guaranteed to us somebody actually has to flip that server on exactly i mean um i see i see two approaches i mean either like you said if you have this federation somebody has to run those servers and even though these are multiple servers i think they would be viewed as custodial although not as not any single server controls the money they will still be viewed as custodial so um you either just switch them on and run them, or you have to try to be compliant. These are the two ways. And in, in that area, it fundamentally differs from coin joins. Because um, what, what Samurai and Wasabi are doing is they are just coordinating. And their legal position is that they are not custodial. They're just coordinating the coin joins, so they, they don't fall under the regulation. And um, well, so these are the two choices, right? You, given, let's say, the technology would be finished, um, somebody has just has to run it, or somebody has to try to run it in a compliant way. And the first has a lot of legal risk, and the second probably needs a lot of uh, money to have this compliance. I mean, what you could do probably is something like uh, the, the liquid setup. You take a bunch of exchanges, already have order KYC AML regulations and they set it up and in that regard it's very similar to liquid um and you could still i mean you could still do some KYC AML on the on the interface to the system that you know when you're putting money in or if you're putting money out and depending where you are you you can enforce certain limits because in in a way when you when you're just having someone it's some merchant um that is legally registered somewhere, they're already paying taxes, so that they don't have a problem KYCing, but it will still give the, the customers a great advantage because you could use these basically anonymous transactions to purchase things online without revealing your identity. And also with transaction fees and, and confirmation speeds that are much, much better than in Bitcoin. 
You know, that's actually kind of an interesting um, point I was planning on bringing up is how just adding or subtracting a blockchain to what is ultimately the same um, federated custody of stuff seems to be looked at so differently by regulators, by governments, and so on. Well, I'm I'm not sure if that will hold in the long term, to be honest. I mean, well, that's yeah. that, that's what let's say Wasabi and Samurai. Uh, at least I'm. I think for both, I heard this podcast with one of the guys from uh, the investment officer. I think from Cypherpunk Holdings, and he was talking about that um, that they, yeah, that they're basically compliant because. Um, they're not they're not custodial but you can always you know make some other case and say oh but they're helping money laundering for example so what are you going to do about that the same problem lightning will have at some point you know when you when you like run right lightning node well you're a money service transmitter right you need a license well i mean that i'm kind of see like that that whole domino of things I I am kind of worried about, um, but I think there there's kind of a domino effect there. Um, you can't make that argument um, about a lightning node unless you're also going to make that argument about a miner or any other um, you know processor or facilitator of of the consensus process because there isn't really custody there. But if you're going to argue that there is, then that argument applies to a lot wider categories than just the lightning node. You know what I mean? Like if, mm. if that's processing a payment, then mm. why isn't a miner putting something in a block processing a payment? Well, why isn't mm. my node just relaying a transaction um, facilitating the processing of a payment? Mm. And so I, I think if, if they like if governments want to go there, they're going to have to go there comprehensively. Like they can't just do just for this one thing. You know what I mean? Well, but in a way that would require that governments are like super rational. And I, I think that in like, let's say in the scene, to, for lack of a better word, we, we often view, look at this from a very, um, computer science perspective, you know, black and white, this rule applies or it doesn't apply. But from a government perspective, my feeling is it's it's mostly about probabilities. You want to, let's say, crack down on money laundering in quotes. And um, so that's how you how you put out the regulation. And um, so that's where you that's why they usually attack um, things which lead to more privacy because that's how you fight money laundering so this thing we discussed earlier was about the um, transaction filtering that's exactly what could happen you know you don't outrule miners but you say okay if you're running a mining pool in this country you have to filter the transactions because they're transactions and similarly you could uh, try to out uh, rule um or make it harder for coin join uh, coordinators just by saying okay you, you you're helping money laundering not so much it's then it's not so much about the custodial question anymore it's more about the helping illegal things mm -hmm. so yeah i i think that's the the major shortcoming really as far as coin joins go is you are obscuring the transaction graph but you're screaming to the entire world that that's what you're doing. Right, right. In, in, in that sense, um, there will be better risk grid because you, you can argue that it's more, it, it, is, um, it is a transaction layer. It is a second layer which helps you to tr tr transact cheaply and, uh, and it helps you to uh, exchange between different chains um but it has the side effect of having much better privacy 
which is ultimately also a consumer protection mechanism. I mean, that's the funny thing, I think, that a lot of these laws are kind of contradictory. You now have all these, you know, privacy laws that prevent corporations from gathering information. And at the same time, you have to identify all your customers as soon as it becomes financial. And um, there might be also some some approach how you could do it legal. You, you legally, you... Um, you do KYC and AML when you go in and out of the system and you have the certain limits and in the system it's private. I mean, that's what, what banking privacy used to be, that uh, they, they do it on the, um, the boundaries of the system, not in, in banks. In banks, you, you should have transaction privacy, at, at least that's how it used to be. Yeah, you know, I've, I've always kind of had a thought about what kind of benefit a Xiaomi and eCash system would bring if you only allowed a note to transfer once? Like, let, let, let's say you had an account-based system and thresholds for which people can withdraw to actual Xiaomi and notes and then force those to just go directly into an account so that all anybody would be able to do is get like their their little ATM amount um, that would float and build the anonymity set into whatever is floating as outstanding notes. And then those could only be spent into people's accounts. Oh, you mean that you basically you can only transfer anonymously once and then you have to take it out into a named account or? So effectively, like whoever was running this would still be seeing the running totals of who has what, but still obscure. Like when I buy coffee from you, they don't see that I'm the one who bought coffee. It's just $5 went to the coffee shop. Yeah, that's something you could do. Um... You you could enforce that on the on the level of the DBCs because it's like but, you know th th these types of things I think like th there is no way around like either somebody is going to have to grow a pair of balls and do something that's highly illegal and pretty much set themselves up to be the next Ross Ulbricht or like people have to find ways and make arguments. Um, for why they should be allowed to do this. Like you look at what uh, all the ICO nonsense um, in 2017 in the Ethereum ecosystem did. Like a lot of them got slapped down, fined, like things happened. But a lot mm -hmm. of them somehow convinced these regulators like, oh, I should be allowed to do this. Like they pulled that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And if you... If Take in four billion in, in ICO money, and you end up paying thirty million in fines. That's I think okay. <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty much the Uber and Airbnb approach, right? You you have to move quickly and then figure out the rest later without going to prison. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, what I think what what you described that was already pretty harsh as a as a measure. I, I, it was probably it would probably be enough if you just uh, impose limits when in exchanging and out exchanging. I mean that's what exchanges do. They they have these different you know KYC limits and um, which it's and according to the regulations and then that would totally work for let's say oh yeah you wanna you wanna spend some Bitcoin anonymously you get an account without KYC you put your whatever two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin in there and you spend it and be a merchant who you know sells the coffee who wants to out exchange a lot more they do the full KYC and then they just book it as um, selling selling coffee like I mean no coffee shop has to prove who paid the coffee it's it's just that they Oh, okay, this is what we took in for coffee. So it is it is probably doable in a in a compliant way, but as as often or as always with these, you know, compliance stuff, it ends up being super expensive in terms of lawyers and licenses you need. So that's not something we could do um 
without taking in venture capital money and, and running this for years. So we would rather just, you know, um, develop the technology to the end and then just either sell it to somebody and later open source or just open source it immediately to um, to somebody who <laughs> grows some a pair, as you put it. Um, and I, ideally, I would, I would love to see both. You know, I would love to see people just run it and others who uh, run it as a company because then you would have multiple federations and then you can you can uh, let the market sort it out and, and see where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And you and, know, it's, I, I really see the potential here if, if, if companies in this space can really see the benefit here and the potential arguments to do that, there's every incentive for them to, to do that. If, if you can get them to pull their heads out of their butts, so to say, like, you know, you, you look at a company like BitGo, um, they're one of the biggest custodians in this space. Mm. And that is exactly the type of thing that they're slowly doing um, without trying to, to broadcast it so much is the different subsidiaries in different jurisdictions and the spreading multi-sigs across those different subsidiaries. And just like that, that institution can now protect itself in that a single jurisdiction's, um, you know, legal processes can't actually force an outcome because mm -hmm. oh, the other key is in that subsidiary's hand in this other jurisdiction. Mm. And just like, just even big financial companies, um, with multi-sig have this tool to kind of shield themselves a little better. Mm. Well, at least against uh, seizing the assets, right? It's, it's much mm -hmm. harder to seize the assets that way. But um, you, you're probably still responsible for signing transactions. I mean, either, I mean, that's also for me a hard question. Who, who is responsible in a federation when you sign a, sign a multi-sig transaction? Is it the, the, the exchanger who introduces the transaction? And basically says, okay, this is my customer, I KYC checked him, and the others just sign it off? Or does every other exchange also has to do his own KYC check? I mean, that I think is just an open question um, that hasn't been asked in the right rooms yet. Um, I mean, Liquid is basically doing that. So, um, but I don't know if it's, um, if they figured it out, if they just basically um rolling with it right now and and see where it goes i mean i think they're kind of just doing the uh you know ask for forgiveness instead of permission <laughs> yeah maybe yeah but that that would be needed and i think the um and the business model is is clearly there you you can as a federation you can make money with uh, transaction fees and you can also you could set uh, fees for either putting money in or taking money out which is similar to how the um join join uh, coordinators work mm -hmm. yeah i think i think i'm gonna let, let, let's topically like kind of zoom out a little bit here um Sure. You know, the, the the whole reason I wanted to have you on here is because you will actually have these skeptical conversations um, <laughs> without pulling out the meme folder. <laughs> but, you know, my general thesis, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, is that it is guaranteed, in my mind, it's going to stay. It's going to be a thing that keeps growing in terms of financial importance um, to the global economy just because of the, the scarcity and the finite cap. But that in no way whatsoever guarantees that Bitcoin creates a magical uh, cypherpunk utopia where everybody has open access to this money or everybody has the ability to transact privately like having this scarce asset guarantees none of those things 
Yeah, I totally agree. It and just it... doesn't follow. It just doesn't follow from it. It's. Um, I also think Bitcoin is probably here to stay. I mean, it has a, the biggest network effects. It has this, um, you know, digital store value kind of USP right now. Um, it has it has been around. It's been around the longest, but it doesn't guarantee that it will, you know, solve problems we i'm actually worried about most yeah i mean it's a completely open um system so everybody can look at everything and see the connections on the transaction graph um it's a highly unscalable system so without um a lot more development in terms of second layers um that's not going to be an open access system. It's going to get very expensive and price a lot of people out. So like where, where in this picture does Bitcoin existing magically guarantee financial utopia? Well, it doesn't. And that's why I'm always so uh, skeptical about these memes. Um, it just doesn't. It's easy to say, oh yeah, Bitcoin fixes this, and uh, it's it's great if numbers go up, but it doesn't solve these problems automatically. That's just wishful thinking. Have Have you ever uh, dove through like the old Bitcoin talk um, stuff from back in the day? Yeah, I, I read my fair share. I think also back in the days, but Did, something you, specific. You... Do you remember Greg Maxwell's post around like 2013, I think it was, on incentives and how quickly Bitcoin grows? No, I can't recall. Um, well, he, he made a very compelling argument in my mind um, that Bitcoin number go up, like it, it just skyrocketing um, in a very short term um, to take its place as this massive core financial asset mm. um that could start wars like if if that really just at the snap of a finger it's just it was nothing and now it's everything um why couldn't that start a war why why would one nation state looking at a competitor or an enemy um starting to amass a bunch of this uh this asset um attack them like you know iran right now um venezuela they, they're becoming pretty decent mining spots right now like if if it really clicks in the u.s government's head bitcoin is happening why wouldn't they just carpet bomb all of those mining facilities so that venezuela and iran um don't start getting a massive advantage because of bitcoin like if 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 it really happens so fast, if this just becomes a game of everybody gets some before the table's empty, um, isn't that a realistic outcome? Well, I mean, I think it, it is at least it is definitely a possibility. Um, what we're seeing right now with all the um, treasuries and institutional investors moving in, I think it is more likely that the state eventually w wants to. Keep keep Bitcoin, kind of pull it into the system, which is what I think we're, we're seeing right now. We're already seeing, you know, exchanges delisting privacy coins because um, they have regulatory problems with them. And, and when you regulate Bitcoin heavily enough, uh, then you don't really have to shut it down anymore. You just, that, that, you just regulate it. It's it's not about shutting it down. It's about guaranteeing that your state is the one that that winds up with a, a massive advantage because of your position in the system. It's it's not about shutting the system down. It's about okay. making sure you have a seat at the table and your enemies don't. Yeah, sure. That's entirely possible. I, I think that what was the Iran story, right? That the uh, Iranian government basically is now forcing miners to sell their coins to them in order so they can use them to circumvent um, export controls mm -hmm. and capital controls. Sure, that's absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's already happening, and um, I can I can see more of that happening in the future, which kind of goes goes to this thing i think you were talking about online uh, with um 
it's very hard to hide miners, especially bigger mining operations. Yep. I mean, like illegal weed dealers have been dealing with that problem um, in terms of hiding things with big thermal footprints for decades. Um, mm -hmm. And the, all of those, those thermodynamics problems become 10 times worse when you're talking about miners versus weed plants. Yeah, absolutely. I think the electricity consumption is also a lot, lot higher, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm, I mean, that's when, when, you, when you're in this meme space, it's, it's very easy to just look at it abstractly, but um, miners and internet cables and all of these things, they are actually in the physical, uh, in the physical realm. And that's where you, of course, always can attack them and regulate them. And, and you, you always have a certain amount of centralization that happens just because um, it's more efficient that way. But you can see with miners, with, with internet cables, um, with um, also now with all these big uh, Bitcoin funds. I mean, there's also a lot of centralization happening there. Nobody's really talking about it. There's a lot of um, Bitcoin centrally controlled or controlled by big entities. Mm-hmm. And it's it's this kind of a, another facet of, of this whole gem here. Um, if Bitcoin is going to magically destroy like all of these legacy institutions and so on and so forth, why? How is that going to work when a lot of them are starting to stockpile this? Like, you see what I mean? Like, it, it Bitcoin does not magically break states or destroy governments. It just becomes a factor in their incentives yeah exactly and um and it doesn't mean that you know i mean sure some the early adapters of, of quite a few of them will get massively rich but it's it's already at that stage now where um let's say this this whole michael sailor story the the entire uh, scene is um celebrating that you know bitcoin is becoming mainstream but in the end it's it's those big institutional investors who will get really rich when when this strategy works so in, in a way he pulled a brilliant he br pulled a brilliant stunt there you, you know you, you buy 425 million dollars worth of bitcoin and then you have this great story and you just run around tell it to everybody and then you inspire other companies to do the same because now companies and institutional investors, they get FOMO and then your own own position multiplies in value. But in the end, it, sure, some early investors will be, be rich or um, some early adapters, they will can retire early, but the cake is, is divided up in the end by um, the people with who already have a lot of the cash because they can build mass buy massive amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're not going to compete, you know, with your stacking sets with uh, institutional investors who can just say, okay, we're going to move a billion into this. And it's like, you know, a, a big fundamental dynamic I see here, and I feel like particularly a lot of the right-leaning people in this space just don't like hearing this, but a lot of the major corporations in the world today, um, they're not just legitimate private entities. Like it's not just a, I legitimately started things and did this legitimately and amassed all this legitimate money. Um, they're revolving doors for people in government. They're the, the new entities being set up so that, um, when government starts wholesaling and closing up shop and privatizing things, the same people can just shift to these entities. So like, you know, Michael Saylor buying a bunch of Bitcoin. What about Google? What about Amazon? What about corporations like that who can put most of their balance sheet into something like Bitcoin and then go, ha ha, government, wink, you can't get this from me. Yeah, right. And I think that's exactly what, what uh, Michael Saylor now wants to inspire people to do. I think uh, Apple has one, more than 100 billion on their balance sheet in cash, which they could, of course, they could move parts of that into, into Bitcoin. And um, 
But to, to circle back a bit, what you said um, about corporations, I think what people often don't understand is that companies, they don't exist in a vacuum. They, they are part of the system. They, they kind of have to follow some rules in order to, to exist. And these rules also um, lead to certain structures of companies, their sizes. I mean, that's, I think, why we, a lot of companies are actually that big is because the regulatory costs to comply so high that the most efficient size for these companies is rather large. Um, you know, as an example, let's say Coinbase, you know, everybody hates Coinbase, but why is Coinbase one of the biggest exchanges? I think the reason is that they have full regulatory compliance in the United States all those uh, banking licenses or the you know license for every single state is super expensive and then they they are the you know, most compliant which makes them the most hated one but on this on the other hand they are the most profitable profitable and um you can you can see that effect in, in, in so many layers um it's also what Taylor was talking about he he put basically put bitcoin on the balance sheet but it doesn't make sense for him to use bitcoin as a payment system because of tax reasons because it would be too expensive and super hard to um, to use actually a, as as a transactional tool. It's more like an asset. And then, at least in my my view, that was never what Bitcoin was about in the early days. It was about you know creating an alternative money and alternative payment system. It's not about it wasn't about having this uh, super scarce digital uh, token that you put on corporate balance sheets. Although it's nice, of course, but. Um, fundamentally solve the problem well i can definitely empathize with that but i mean as as far as my attitude about bitcoin in that regard goes um i have always just looked at it as a thing and it's going to evolve and be used um in the way that makes the most sense whatever that is and like th that that that's kind of like I don't know. I really think that's kind of at the root of like what bugs me um, as far as people not willing to engage in this type of skepticism for the most part. Th like you're looking at Bitcoin like you know what it is or what it's going to do. Mm. None of us do. I agree, yeah. And the narrative, of, I mean, it, it changes and it probably changes partially because uh, it's a deliberate, you know, new narrative, but also partially because Bitcoin changes, you know, what it is does change. You know, this digital store value story, for example, is, is, is rather new. And uh, that's, that's because it changed and also because um, it was created as a narrative. Well, I don't really think it's either new or that Bitcoin changed. It's just that that was the way out of all the different ways people looked at Bitcoin that really caught on. Like, that's just what makes sense to the most people who, who come in and look at this and go, I want some of that. That is what I mean with, with change, like the position in the market in a way changed okay. or how, how, it, how it's been seen in the market. In the, I mean, in the very early days, it was just like this um, new, exciting thing, but nobody was really sure how we can use it and if it will work. And then people used it to buy drugs online and, and now it, it, it became more um, settled in a way. And that's how it changed, although it fundamentally didn't technically didn't change that much. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I see what you mean now. But it's like, you and, know, it's, it's just, it, it, like, Bitcoin is, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, it's going to, like, wh whatever people try to make it in net, that's what it's going to be. And it's, it's like, it, it kills me that nobody recognizes this and really does much beyond memeing about things. Yeah, but it, it might also be, you know, the, yeah, let's say the, the cremation bias in, um, 
in our scene or what 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 we see when we look around on crypto twitter um i don't think you know let's say uh institutional investor or some uh some treasurer from the company or some government analyst that they are considering the memes that important they they have, have their own thoughts but they they talk about this in a different in a different bubble so uh, i think also a lot about our selection bias and the bubble we are in in crypto twitter and the meme warfare that's going on there so um I, I doubt, you know, like some family office guy is particularly concerned with memes when he makes a decision to put money in Bitcoin or not. And that, that that's kind of a that that really is kind of like a core part of like the shift going on right now is like we're we're growing out of the, the meme war um phase. Like me memes aren't gonna do much anymore because ninety percent of uh people who get in are only going to see a tiny fraction of things and they're going to get in and they're not going to be paying attention to the memes. They're going to be looking at what's, what's the value of this doing? Um, Hey, what kind of services or, or hardware devices can I use? Like they're not going to be looking at memes. They're going to be looking at what is concretely out there. Yeah. And then suddenly things like, um, who is behind this? How trustable are the institutions? Um, you know, how, how established is the hardware wallet company? All these things suddenly become important because that's how these people think. Um, this this grace grade bust thing is it's killing me. You know, they they fought like two point five percent of all Bitcoin in circulation, and they charging you two percent per year to hold them. And how are you going to explain that with a meme? You know, why, why do people pay 2% per year for somebody else to hold their Bitcoin? And the reason is it's interfacing with the legacy financial system. And that's the only way these uh, institutional investors can put their money in. And it has a huge effect on Bitcoin and it's not going to be solved by memes. And it's, you know, people acting in the marketplace, they change Bitcoin through doing that. And we're just, you know, engaging with but memes it just means we're, we're not paying attention to that at all and think it will all just magically fix everything same like with you know u.s election you know what has bitcoin to do with the u.s election not very much it's not going to solve anything in that regard but it is it is very convenient you know to just you know pump memes out and and not actually engage with the actual problems i think mm -hmm. Like, you know, here's like something to kind of circle back to um, privacy stuff um, that mm -hmm. I don't really think is clicked in a lot of people's heads. Um, you either really do need universal use of second layers by almost everybody in terms of just getting the timing correlation of actual transactions off chain. Or you need almost everybody to not pay their taxes. Because if you have in, in the taxes that you report and pay all this timing information, and that is tightly correlated with you doing things on chain, like I send to the exchange and sell within the hour. So just look at that, that point in the block um, at that time and find the right transaction. And just because you paid your taxes and you didn't obscure that timing correlation with the, the sale or whatever and on-chain activity, the tax authority is building a beautiful set of data to de-anonymize everything. Mm. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's that's why I think the, the payment story is so important. Uh, it's it's not so much about mixing. It's about yeah, how can we have actual transactions that are also private. And like you said, you you would need quite a bit of uptake there to to make it work. Mm -hmm. And for and that, you you need you need good use cases. So you either need. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot. What what 
is actually the, the use case for a system like Squid or another second layer. And you either need good payments, I think, where you can, let's say, you could buy um, articles or whatever. But, but like, for example, I can see that for online articles as a, as a way to monetize uh, journalism, for example, where when you have cheat transactions, you could actually do that um, with a system like that, or you would have moving uh, liquidity between exchanges. Um, you, you need some use case which has a high enough uptake so that you can have the um, privacy benefit for all people as a secondary effect. Like you said earlier, you know, with now when you look at the the coin joints, it it's always suspicious immediately. In a, in a way, Monero is is much better that way because um, every transaction is private. It's much less suspicious to send a Monero to an exchange than sending Bitcoin, which came from a coin join. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, th th there's this, this thought, um, it's actually, uh, no para the, uh, head of the Wasabi wallet who thought mm -hmm. of this, but just trying to kind of ease in, um, Xiaomi and token systems as just like one use, um, like prepaid tokens for a specific service. So like rather than like a general like micro tipping thing, like go to the New York Times and buy some of their token, um, but just have it be transferable. So like ostensibly, it's just like buying a, a gift card for somewhere, but made digitally transferable and just kind of try to backdoor a web of effectively businesses that are also acting as banks. Um, and just kind of try to ease that in there as well. It's like a gift card. Like I can hand you a gift card in, in the real world, right? There's nothing illegal about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Th that's that's another approach. <laughs> We've also been thinking about that one. It's um, just a matter of how how are you gonna basically pull it off and bring it to enough people and um, probably need some sort of industry that has a lot of uh, need for it or you need somebody with deep enough guts to uh, market it and uh, get enough um, critical mass. Honestly, I, I, was, I was always thinking it might be great for, let's say, online porn because they have... <laughs> they, <laughs> Well, they have the need, you know, they, they are censored yeah. a lot by, by credit card companies and the customers, they, at least in my mind, should have a need to pay for it a little bit more anonymously. So nobody can track exactly what kind of kink you're into, you know. I mean, yeah, that is definitely a digital platform that would draw in more than a tiny fringe. Yeah. But it's it's just like ultimately though like you know it's it's just it's the reality is I think you can't escape you need to lobby for better tax rules um like it's just a necessity to kind of escape this dynamic of how much a tax authority could de-anonymize things um like in, in Germany if I remember right like you just hold coins for more than a year. And then there is no gains. Like you can just spend them, use them as money. Um, like there is zero um, equivalent uh, regulations or laws like that in the US. Like it doesn't matter if I'm moving like a hundred bucks of Bitcoin or 10 cents. Like if I spend it or I relinquish control of it to somebody else, capital gains. Oh, it never times out. Mm -hmm. it's 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 no there is zero um regulatory setup for me to use that like money without capital gains it is mm. always an asset there is always capital gains and that's the whole basis by which if you are paying your taxes properly um you're potentially providing a lot of de-anonymizing information on chain mm, i see yeah yeah it's also 
if I understood it correctly, the reason why you cannot really use it uh, as a company for for payments because you would have all these taxable events and it makes mm -hmm. much more sense to put it on your balance sheet once and then maybe sell it at some point and have one taxable event or even borrow against it. Yeah. And but you're, you're, you're correct. In Germany, it's, it is considered an asset and you have like this sort of... Uh, capital gains or speculation tax, but that only applies in the first year. So after a year, it's um, gains or tax free. And I think countries like Switzerland, they, they never have that for, um, for cryptocurrencies. So you basically you have to pay wealth tax on your holdings at the end of the year, but you don't have to pay um, capital gains if, if yeah number go up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, in the U.S., there is zero chance that anything would happen that would allow like micro strategy to use Bitcoin um, for significant payments without capital gains. But like without some kind of exemption for like dumb retail consumer level payments and stuff, um, then either everybody is paying taxes and providing this massive data set um, potentially if they figure out they can do that or everybody is cheating their taxes um, and there's probably going to be a ratcheting up of pressure against that mm. yeah you're right but i'm i'm usually very uh, critical of thinking that you could change that by lobbying i think it's much more realistic to have some technologies which are Basically, you can get away with not reporting everything 100%. That's, that's also something I've been thinking about lately that all this, you know, the war on cash. I have the fear that if we actually get rid of cash, that um, a lot of the world economy would just simply collapse. Because I think a lot of states, they don't really understand how much of the economy depends on these, you know, gray market transactions, which are not taxed and how much more expensive everything would get if, um, if you would actually tax everything. Yeah. I mean, the, the last time I looked at, um, statistics and data, the, the black market, including gray market shit was the second biggest economy in the world next to the United States. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a funny story here in Germany. Um, they they shut down now all the restaurants for November, and uh, due to you know like some sort of light um, lockdown, so no no restaurants just for takeout and no hotels uh, um, except for like very important business meetings and stuff like that. And then they said, okay, the businesses they get compensation. So as a restaurant owner, you get 75% of the November 2019 revenue you get as compensation for being forced to shut down your restaurant. Um, but the, the funny or actually tragic thing is that if you know a little bit about the restaurant business here is that um, the only way to run a profitable restaurant business is you basically have this... Um, yeah, triple entry bookkeeping where you do parts of your revenue uh taxed and parts you do untaxed and it's an open secret in the in the business that you can run a profitable business in a profitable restaurant without doing some tax cheating so this 75 percent um money they get it's it's not enough because it's it turns out to be maybe 50 or less percent of the actual revenue and that, that that's the situation in many uh Especially in you know the low paid um, business areas, I think it, it's the same situation everywhere. And if you would get rid of cash there, I mean prices would just skyrocket. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm kind of of the mind of tech or legal action that both should be done simultaneously. Like people should absolutely build things like that if that's what it comes to, but mm. try the other route too. You know what I mean? 
Sure, I mean it, it. It can't hurt. It's it's just for me. It's a personal preference that I'm I'm a tech person, so I'm I'm focusing on the tech solution and I'm focusing on voting with my feet as much as I can. Um, but I'm certainly happy if people go the other route and maybe make some inroads there and uh, yeah, simplify regulation or have a more reasonable tax law. That would be great. I mean, it's just like ultimately the, these kinds of issues exist at every layer of the system. You know what I mean? The marketplaces, the the mining ecosystem, um, just what can be gleaned from what people are doing on the blockchain. And yeah, um, there are just not enough developers in this damn space um, right now. There just aren't. You mean for the, the privacy issues or generally? I mean, just like all of the issues, like the privacy alone is a tall order, but then like, look at mining, um, in order to put that in, in order, in my opinion, you have to turn mining pools into distributed protocols so that any kind of regulatory issue, um, any government issue comes down to the actual operator of a set of hardware. And there is no easier choke point to go pressure or, or fuck with. And if, if we don't, you know, really protocolize that, then that situation is already like, there's still a high likelihood lots of miners are going to be under the thumb of regulators. But if you don't protocolize that, it's a million times easier. Go pressure the pools. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's uh, unfortunately usually the stuff that doesn't have the highest priority in people's minds. And it's not where you can, you can easily see a, a story where it would make sense to spend a lot of VC dollars in. I mean, the privacy story is already kind of tough because of the regulatory backslash. Uh, backlash um but the for the mining pool stuff it can, kind of comes down to people just doing it because they think it's important or um, financing it to for the better yeah for the better state of the ecosystem but i don't really see how how you can attract you know uh, the, the capital for financing um, developers there i mean it's but i have i haven't I haven't thought deeply about it though, but um, it just seems that it, it there's not a lot of um, thoughts going into this. I mean, it's it's not that no thought; it's just like a lack of looking at things comprehensively. Like you know what I mean? Like just the memes again. Like back in 2017, like the meme is the one thing we are focused on is scaling transactions, like big mm. blocks versus second layers. And then like after that was was settled and done. Like the one thing we're focused on now is privacy. And it's like there are so many more fractal issues. Like the these issues with the scalability of mining and regulatory mm -hmm. like issues there, um, how that connects to the privacy issues. I mean, just the peer to peer layer for the, the protocol is an unencrypted, like plain text stream. Like it, 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 there is no one thing that everybody should be focused on. Like, this is the thing we're doing. Like there is so much shit that needs to get done to counter um you know attack vectors it's not yeah. it's not just one thing yeah absolutely uh you, you just mentioned what what i wanted to get into um that was also some pet peeve of mine a few years ago is the actual um messaging layer in bitcoin i'm not sure if it had improved my feeling is it hasn't that most of the stuff is still running on the default port unencrypted right that's mm -hmm. how they so th that's, you know, that, that what ticks me off when I hear this, yeah, Bitcoin can't be censored. Sure, you, you set up, if you just kill the, the, the protocol. 
on the you know uh, package filter a little basically. Yep, and you can see everybody broadcasting anything that isn't running on Tor. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's super easy to to switch that off um, in uh, in 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 the uh, routing architecture. You just filter it, and then you probably have a network split of five. And then, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, I think it was. Um, I hope I'm not um, mixing people up, but I think Antoine um, Riard. Um, a Bitcoin core developer um, proposed a while back um, a, the altnet framework and pretty much just um, creating like a, a modular plug and play um, like middleware for the, the actual node to be able to just seamlessly handle like arbitrary um, different messaging protocols. And mm -hmm. I think... Um, I forget her name. Um, I blame the alcohol I consumed last night. Um, but I, th I think as he, I, I'm, I'm not, it's, I'm not even going to try and go for a name, but, um, Antoine, um, another new dev who, um, just got involved in the last couple months and, um, somebody else are apparently kind of concentrating on the, uh, peer to peer stuff now, but it's like, we, we need more of that. And I think the important part is like messaging and getting across like the fact that there are all of these comprehensive problems so that developers who come into this space, it's not just, oh, everybody's doing lightning stuff now or like, you know what I mean? Like actually paint the landscape ahead of time so that devs don't have to dig through the whole code base and see the state of things that way. It's like help guide the the attention in a, in a more efficient way yeah absolutely and um that, that's where i think this is the, the meme stuff is harmful because it always paints this picture there's no problem and first of all there are some problems and second of all there um the the landscape isn't static so it is changing and some things it, you know nobody is thinking about that right now but it might turn out to be a super important um, vector. And for, for things like Bitcoin, it, it, is, it would be good to have, you know, more uh, diversity in quotes. And, you know, what we just talked about, diversity in the how do you actually transfer the messages between nodes? Because if you have some, you have some diversity there in methods, that means it's, it's harder to attack and it's more, more robust. You don't want to have... Um, all people just using, you know, the, the same transport layer. Mm -hmm. Similar to the, the implementation side. I mean, that's, that's a big uh, philosophical uh, discussion in and of itself. Is, is it good to have just one implementation or is it good to have multiple ones? And um, just so you're, you're not going down if you have, if you have a, problem, a bug in, in the canonical implementation. That is actually something that I agree with Satoshi on. Um, I think it would be better for any failure to be universal so that any response to that failure also creates a universal outcome. Like if something's going to hiccup in a significant way, um, everybody should hiccup in the same way and then inherently be drawn to respond to that in the same way rather than like well if if something hiccups and there is no universal or universal outcome there then that's where shit gets really screwy yeah it, it has the um the danger that you get forks that way or unintended forks right mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm not 100 percent sure i'm I tend to agree with also with that position that it, it especially since the protocol is not 100% specified and that a lot of is the um, specified by implementation um, that it's I tend to agree on the actual node implementation but for the for the message layer you definitely need alternatives 
Yeah, absolutely. I like my, my attitude about core is it should be ripped down to just the consensus engine and database handling. And then ev everything else should just be plug and playable. Like if, if you do that right, there should be no consensus risks there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hmm. I'm kind of plumbed out of all the stuff that was rattling around my head I wanted to talk about. Is there uh, anything in particular you'd like to get into uh, people don't apply enough skepticism to? Uh, I think I also exhausted the things I had on my mind pretty much. Yeah. Well, I'm also going to blame the alcohol for this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe let me just add that I was, uh, I was surprised you, uh, you seemed much nicer in person than online. So <laughs> in, well, your, in, your in your Twitter, you have a certain persona, which is uh, more abrasive than you are in, uh, in voice. So don't take it as an insult. Just, uh, you know what I mean? I, I think. Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I think that is just because I got sick of spending hours in massive threads with people um, and just got to the point where I'm going to say my piece and I'm going to call you an idiot and I'm not going to get dragged into a thread for the next two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it has a certain entertainment value, so I'm, I'm enjoying that as well. So, uh, but I find it in general, I find it, I find it often very interesting how, how people come across very differently online than in person or via voice. I mean, I haven't met you in person, so um, there's probably still another layer. Um, well, yeah. I think it's just the shitty constraints of Twitter and micro blog structures. Um, I don't want to sit here all day, so I'm just going to be very brief and then I'm going to open another window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's also related to the uh, the whole branding thing, you know. That a lot of people just create a brand for for themselves, and then they have to fit in that brand. And uh, um, I'm purely, not saying you're doing that, but purely but that trying to spend less time on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and Twitter also has the network effects, right? So until they censor us all, we'll probably be there. Well, that's why I'm still there. Yeah. But yeah, uh, this, this has been a really entertaining chat. It, it's nice to actually talk to somebody who will entertain skepticism and not just start flinging memes back in response. Yeah, it was fun. Um, we should repeat that another day. Mm -hmm. definitely but, um, when your hang hangover is cured I, I, I don't know that might never happen <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I uh, hope everybody uh, listening enjoyed the chat and uh, you know thanks for coming on Frank yeah thanks a lot for having me take care catch you later punks <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to